Right, so hello and welcome to this Yes for EU webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Maura Williamson, I'm the convener of Yes for EU. Um, this evening we've got an extremely important and urgent topic to consider. Can we protect Scotland's food, health and environment post-Brexit? We're very fortunate in having contributions from three experts. Thank you so much to all our panellists, Professor Alison Pollock, Lorna Slater and Jim Fairley. Our twin objectives in Yes for EU are to campaign for Scottish independence and for Scotland to gain its rightful place in the EU as an independent nation. In Scotland, our values of democracy, equality, fairness, sustainable development, human rights and well-being for everyone. These closely reflect the values of the EU. We believe that the, the best, or maybe now the only way for Scotland to pursue those principles for a better future for Scotland is as an independent country, which is a full member of the EU. Please consider joining us uh, as a Yes for EU member, if you haven't already, and uh, we'll put the link in the chat panel on your screen in a moment. Um, and please look out for our future events and um, share and follow and like us on social media if you use social media. All our events are online at the moment, obviously, but hopefully we'll be out and about campaigning soon. Um, and uh, now I'll introduce uh, Sam Page and Leslie Stark from the Yes We Eat You team and they will be our hosts for this webinar. Hi, um, I'm Sam Page and I'm delighted to be with you this evening. I'm going to be co-hosting, as Maureg says, with, with Leslie. So Scotland has been dragged out of the EU against the democratic will of the Scottish people. It's now too late to extend the transition period so we are now for, faced with a hard or no deal Brexit at the end of this year. This means that the UK government may force Scottish industry to diverge from EU standards so they can sign trade deals with the USA and China. This will affect our food, health and environmental standards and ultimately could also affect an independent Scotland's ability to join the EU. To find out more, we have three expert speakers who are knowledgeable in each of these sectors. Firstly, uh, Professor Alison Pollock is director of the Newcastle Centre for Excellence in Regulatory Science. She has directed research and teaching units at Queen Mary University of London and the University of Edinburgh. She is a member of the Independent Sage Group. Lorna Slater is the co-leader of the Scottish Greens she was born in Canada, educated at the University of British Columbia, and is currently the engineering project manager at Orbital Marine Power Limited. I understand also she does some circus acts too. <laughs> Jim Fairley is a farmer and food lover. He was the founder of Scotland's first farmers market in Perth and a co-founder of Farmers for Yes, a farmers activist group established for the 2014 referendum. So each speaker will speak for approximately 15 minutes. There'll also be time for one or two questions after each of the presentations. And then we'll invite all three speakers to take part in the Q&A at the end of the final presentation. Some of you have sent questions in by email beforehand. Um, but if you want to ask a question once you hear the speakers, please use a Q&A box, which will appear by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, don't use a chat for questions. The chat is for comments and information only. So, okay. So, thankfully, um, Jim has volunteered to go first. So, I um, the floor now is yours, Jim, or the airways, or whatever we say. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I was coerced to go first. Let's not kid it on here. I was coerced. <laughs> um, can we protect Scotland's food, health, and environment post Brexit? Um, first of all, you said that I was an expert. I wouldn't claim to be an expert on anything. Uh, and I, I, I don't like the use of the word expert at all, so forgive me. Um, can we protect Scotland's food, health and environment post-Brexit? Well, what I can tell you is I went out and bought a Euro lottery ticket tonight, just in case, um, because I, I have grave concerns about where we're going. But the simple answer to that question, of course we can. There's absolutely no doubt that we can protect it. Protect it. 
but you have to have a government whose priority is match the industry that you're trying to protect in the first place. And we currently have a UK government and a Scottish government who are clearly going in different directions. Um, the English uh, or the UK government's agricultural bill that is going through the House of Commons or has gone through the House of Commons is now sitting with the House of Lords is clearly designed towards um, environmental protections, access to land, all the things that the Scottish government have been doing up here for over a decade. And it gives the impression that the farmers in this country aren't already doing that. But there is very little mention in the UK agricultural bill about agriculture as a food producer. And that should be our primary focus. How do we produce good quality, safe, sustainable um, food for the country, having a domestic food supply where we can protect the livelihoods um, of the, the rural inhabitants, where we stop rural uh, depopulation, and we protect the fastest growing sector in the Scottish economy, which is the food and drink sector, uh, because agriculture underpins the entire food and drink sector. The reputation that we have worldwide is phenomenal. Um, and it's one of the reasons, and we will come back to it, as to why the, uh, the, the dilution of the Scottish brand, which has been very evident since 2015, is so dangerous and so important that we try to protect it. Um, there are various challenges that we face, and, not that, and we shouldn't forget, ladies and gentlemen, COVID is going to have a massive effect on the food and drink sector in Scotland. The number of business, my, my, our own included, that have been um, decimated this year is going to be phenomenal. The, the pickup from that is going to have to be very much driven by the government to make sure that a lot of these businesses are still there at the end of COVID, let alone Brexit. So there are, there are several points that I wanted to, to pick up on tonight. Um, we've got, uh, there's a list of things that I went through and thought we'll focus on a couple of them. GM foods is one of them, food standards, labeling, uh, protected geographical indicators, welfare standards, and labor. And I mean labor in the terms of, of how do we provide the labor for, uh, for the industry going forward. The free movement ends on the 21st of January, as we know. And the UK government have set up the Migration Advisory Council, our committee, um, and they're, they're bringing a points-based system to allow people to come into the country. And I think the, the role that you're applying for, you need to have a sponsorship, and the role that you're applying for needs to have a minimum wage of £26,500, or £25,600, I should say. The job has to be classified to an appropriate level, um, which is the equivalent of a Scottish hire or a modern apprenticeship. Um, and if the role is deemed as a, 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 a shortage occup as, as on the shortage occupation list, then you'll get more points for that and the, the financial threshold comes down a bit. Now, all of that is great um, that they're doing something. Uh, the, the farming unions lobbied very hard um, when the, the, migratory, the, the migration bill was being um, put forward to make sure that there was a, an agricultural worker scheme so that you could get temporary agricultural staff coming into the country. And when they started off that scheme, there was 2,000 people were going to be allowed into the country. Angus and Persia would use up more than 2,000 people. So the, the scheme was wholly inadequate. So they've listened to that and they've increased it to 10,000. 10,000 is about 60,000 short of what we need across the entire UK in terms of the number of staff to bring in seasonal fruit and veg uh, right, across the, right across the industry. What we don't talk about often enough is the number of um, particularly EU migrants who are working in the abattoir facilities, in the food processing facilities, in the, uh, the restaurant trade, uh, who are waiters, who are doing the jobs that, and it's one of the things that we, we've talked about for, for a large number of years, is that a waiter in this country is, is somebody who is a student waiting to go off to university or is classed as a low-skilled worker. In Europe, a waiter is classed as a professional. And that type of, of standard of um, how we classify the job to me is very important, particularly when we have aspirations for the kind of uh, food and drink industry that we want to have going forward. 
So there are, there are real challenges coming up in terms of the labour market. Um, and we need to keep up the pressure on the UK government to make sure that there is going to be an adequate supply of people coming into the country who are going to want to do these jobs. And I think what COVID has done has uh, completely exposed the lie that there are plenty of people in this country who are going to be prepared and be skilled enough to do the jobs that we are going to need through the summer. There are large numbers of EU migrant workers in the country right now picking berries while I don't know how many millions of people have been furloughed. Um, the, the, the attitude was that, well, berry picking is a, is a, is a low, it's a low skilled job, there's nothing to it, and it's almost beneath the people in this country. Farmers went out and were looking, the, the, the NFU put out a, a, a thing on their Facebook page and on their, on their social media, asking people to come and work in the fruit picker industry, and they would do it. So if we've got the kind of levels of employment that we've, we've had pre-COVID in the, in the UK, how are we possibly going to expect to get the right number of people with the right work ethic and attitude to be able to go and pick the fruit and the vegetables to get them on our shelves in a, a, an eatable uh, standard? Because I've picked berries, I know how difficult it is to be able to go and actually pick the right berries at the right time, get them in unbruised and get them delivered without getting penalties for the, for the farmer. So it's, it is a highly skilled job. And one of the other things I think we need to think about is who key workers are, because the unskilled labour that we've talked about, uh, we now know how skilled and how absolutely essential they are to our economy because of COVID. So that I hope that at the other side of this, what we've got is um, a far greater appreciation of the people who are doing the kind of jobs that the people in this country don't want to do. So la labour is a major issue, which is going to, to give us some serious problems. Food standards is another one. And you will probably know that Neil Parrish, uh, who is actually a, a Conservative MP down in England, put forward uh, an amendment to the Agricultural Bill. And he, what he said was that if you look at page 57 of the Tory Manifesto, it said, in all our trade negotiations, we will not compromise on our high environmental protections, animal welfare and food standards. So he put the amendment forward to, to put that in law that we would not lower the standards of the food that was coming into this country. Now we know that that amendment was voted down and I think it is very telling that 22 Tory MPs broke the whip in order to try and get the amendment on the bill and yet all six Scottish Tories who are all representing um, uh, rural seats where there are big ag agricultural uh, communities, all voted against the amendment. Um, and I was going to try and keep this um, tonight apolitical, but we'll see how that works out. Um, the amendment was, was rejected, um, and it, it's now in the House of Lords, and I don't think that there's going to be anything will come back from the House of Lords to say that we can um, try to get the amendment put back on. Uh, but we have to think about what it means. We, in, in 1996, ractopamine was banned by the EU. Um, the US and New Zealand didn't ban it. And these are the two countries that the UK are currently striving to do uh, trade deals with. And we know that they use uh, ractopamine in pork and in beef. It's a, it's a hormone to try and uh, create more lean meat but it has major implications for human health. Um, we have also stopped uh, using chlorine to clean uh, chickens in, this, in the EU back in 1996, I think it was, um, but they still do it in America. So we all, we all know about these stories about the, the American food standards, but th these aren't just protectionist issues. They're protecting the consumers in this country because the levels of food poisoning that you have in America, as opposed to over here, are dramatically different. So we've got a, a, a responsibility to make sure that the food that we're producing is of, of the highest safety standards. And the fear is, of course, that what we're going to get is the UK saying, no, no, we won't, we won't lower the standards. 
for farmers in this country, but we'll export the standards so that the Americans and the New Zealanders and anybody else who wants to do it, they can continue to produce food with these kind of chemicals in use and with the kind of standards that we would not get away with uh, in this country. And what they're now talking about is they will put tariffs on uh, to make sure that we have a system which penalizes them before they come in here. Now, if you're part of the American trade delegation, you're not going to allow those standards to be so prohibitive that it becomes too expensive to bring them over here. They're going to be very tough in their negotiation stance that what they want is access to our food industry and the, the placing of uh, tariffs which are going to be prohibitive are not going to be allowed. And if we allow, if we put tariffs on American products, then you have to go with WTO rules. You're going to have to put the same level of tariffs across anybody else who's going to be coming into the country as well or trading with us in the country as well. So the UK are, are backing themselves into a corner here um, in their desperation to get these deals. So we, um, we also have to remember is that the US are very clear that what they don't want is, is clear labelling. And clear labelling is, is absolutely vital. The UK government have said that they are not going to um, take powers back from the Scottish government, but they have the power over labelling. And some of you may know that during the, the CETA deal, the Comprehensive European Trade Association deal with Canada, the UK, along with all the other European countries, was given the opportunity to put in protective geographical indicators. That's things like Scotch beef, um, Stonaway black pudding, Arbroath Smokies. These, all, these are all what you call PGIs. And the UK is the only country in the entire EU which didn't put any PGIs in place. And you kind of think to yourself, was that a precursor because they knew the direction that they were going in the first place? So there, there aren't going to be the PGIs unless the UK government decide that they're going to introduce a, a, a very um, similar system to what's in place with the EU. But if we're out of the EU and we're then trying to introduce these PGIs on the basis of what we had in the EU, it's going to be very difficult to get Scotch beef protected or Scotch lamb protected because the EU had a hell of a job getting it done in the first place. So we're going to face a, a real challenge to be able to, get, to keep that brand, which is so valuable to the industry, uh, we're going to have a real difficulty in actually keeping that in place. Um, we have to... Uh, sorry, I've lost my, lost my thread a wee bit there. We've got to um, start looking at what it means to lose the brand and if the, the, the trade negotiations, if the, the US do put these stipulations in place, then what does that mean for us? If they're in place for, uh, for America, they're in place for Australia, they're in place for New Zealand, and we, and we can't brand it. But where that leaves us is that the, the UK will allow foodstuffs to come into this country and there'll be very little labelling. And I don't know if any of you follow the Keep Scotland the Brand campaign, which um, uh, Ruth Watson had set up. It's a very important campaign because... What that's doing is keeping in people's minds that that, that saltire is so valuable to our food and drink industry. But the Australians call a sirloin steak a Scotch fillet. And the Scotch brand, if we want to put a Scotch fillet steak on the shelves, they could quite legally put on a Scotch fillet of Australian beef and with a tiny wee disclaimer on the back or a wee uh, country of origin on the back. But it takes a consumer six seconds to look at something on the, on the shelf and put it into their basket. They're not all going to be taking the time to say, right, that's a Scotch fillet and that's a, a fillet of Scotch. So what's the difference looking at the back and making the decision? But what they will look at is the price. And the price of a fillet of Scotch beef with Australian um, uh, or it's country of origin on the back of it is going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than what the Scotch fillet of beef uh, as, a, as a, a fillet steak is going to be on the shelf. So. There are real challenges going forward in terms of how we protect our brand and how much labeling we are going to be able to put on the products as we go forward. So these are two clear problems that we have. Um, as I say, the US don't want to have clear labeling. They don't want country of origin on it. 
So it's going to be very difficult for the consumers, even the consumers who want to look for it, it's going to be very difficult for them to be able to find the kind of products that they're looking for. Um, there is no labeling at all on processed foods, so you could be getting ractamine um, fed beef and pork coming into the country in, in pre-packed meals. Um, so, so there are real dangers in terms of where we go with the, with the trade agreement with, with, um, with America. And we've got massive challenges, ladies and gentlemen. We, we really do have massive challenges. But we've also got a real opportunity because one of the major success stories in Scotland is our food and drink sector. It's the fastest growing sector in the economy. It's currently worth over £14 billion pounds a year to us. And the chief executive of um, Scotland Food and Drink is a guy called James Withers. He's a brilliant guy. And they have pulled off a phenomenal series of successes over the last, over the last 10 or 15 years. And they've set a new target that we have a thing called Ambition 2030. And that is to make the Scottish food and drink industry be worth 30 billion pounds to the Scottish economy by the year 2030. Um, what that looks like is uh, a huge increase in the, the exports that we put out of the country. Um, there is no doubt that Brexit may actually help us in our exporting ambitions. Um, but it will employ, if we reach that target of, of 30 billion pounds by the year 2030, it will be an, an industry that employs a million people across the entire sector. But that's not going to happen under the current system. It's not going to happen while we're part of the UK, and it's certainly not going to happen while we're part of the UK, who is determined to follow the kind of trade deals and the kind of practices that they're going into the, at the moment to, to deal with America, New Zealand, Australia, and anybody else. I've got absolutely no qualms with going out and trading with the world. I think we can compete anywhere in the world, but it's going to be on the fact that we are a niche product, we are competitive in price insofar as you get what you pay for, but we've got a, a, a worldwide recognized brand which is absolutely fabulous, and we are in danger of losing it. When we hear the UK government telling us that they have um, agreed to repatriate the one and a half million pounds a year in the, the funds for um, marketing, because every year, every when we raise animals in this country, when they get slaughtered, we all pay a, a, a levy, and that levy is then given to uh, QMS, and QMS, Call It Meat Scotland, is the is the body which then does the promotion for us to, to promote red meat in this country. But any animal that is taken south of the border and it's born, reared, fattened and sold in Scotland, when it goes south of the border and gets slaughtered, that, that animal's levy stays down in England with the AHDB. We've been fighting for years to have that money repatriated and last year the UK government said, yes, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to bring that one and a half million pounds back. But in reality, what they're doing is they're putting that money into a pot with the EHDB, and, or the AHDB, I should say. And what they're doing is that's then going to market generically. So it'll then become a UK brand again. And QMS can input into that, and they can say, well, these are the areas that we want to target and highlight. But that money is not specifically coming back for us to be able to market our Scotch um, a brand worldwide. And again, I say we don't know where we're going to land up as far as PGIs are concerned, um, even if we've got a Scotch brand to protect at the end of this. So there are massive challenges with where we are, but there is a massive opportunity to be able to put it right. And the opportunity is making sure that we return a majority of independent supporting parties next year and get our independence so that we can get ourselves out of the union, which is proving so costly and so damaging to us right now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, Leslie, do you have a few questions, or one or two questions for him?
Um, yes, I do. Sorry. Can I encourage people to put questions um, into the Q&A if you have any for um, later on for all the panellists or just for Jim? Um, so we have, I think you touched on quite a lot of the things that we had questions about because a lot of them were about um, the, the things like labelling and high tariffs on um, Scottish um, exports. Um, so the first question was, to what extent will Scottish producers will still be able to label their products with place of origin, um, with production methods, etc., um, e.g. organic grass reared from beef from five Persia raspberries are both smokies. Um, so you did actually touch on that. Um, and you also touched on the problems that there's going to be going forward. But if we don't get independence, which is going to take a while, is there anything that the Scottish government or people in Scotland can do to help protect that those brands? I don't know if you, some of you may follow this, some of you may not. The, the Keep Scotland the Brand campaign has been a phenomenal tool. Um, but what I am going to say is, if it's got a jack, put it back. Absolutely not, because that's the kind of thing that is going to simply set people against the idea of independence, because it's then seen as nasty nationalism. And I put up a post a couple of weeks ago challenging Tesco's on why there were no Scottish eggs in their supermarket in the Edinburgh Road. And the, it got almost 300,000 impressions, and what it became was a pylon between one side saying if it's got a jack, put it back, and the other side saying, um, let's just say it was a very unpleasant um, exchange on Twitter. That's not the purpose of promoting Scottish. It's not to try and demean. If supermarkets will do what they're doing in order to make the most amount of money. And Tesco's actually came back to me and said, because of COVID, we're having difficulties getting uh, the, the kind of clear labelling we would normally have, but we'll do our best to sort it. Now, I don't believe them, and I don't believe that they didn't have Scotch beef because they were trying to sort it. I think they thought, right, this is easier. Um, it will cost us uh, a, a half penny less for every box if we can do it down here and stick a Union Jack on it, everybody will be fine. We need to put pressure on the supermarkets because they are the ones who are supplying the vast majority of the food in this country. But we cannot be divisive about it. We can't be aggressive about it. If we want to be aggressive, let's get aggressive in the political arena and tell the Tories in London and the Labour Party in this country that we don't accept the fact that they won't allow a Section 30, that the people of Scotland are sovereign and we will make our own decisions about where we're going to be as an independent country. But we should try and keep that separate from getting into this, uh, we hate the Tories. Um, and Because bear in mind, there are 450,000 Tories in this country who vote Tory on the basis that they think that that's going to be the kind of party that's going to deliver the kind of lifestyle that they want. But more and more of them are coming over to seeing that an independent Scotland will be just as inclusive, just as dynamic, even more dynamic than what we've got as part of the UK. So let's just keep encouraging them to come in and try and stop the divisiveness. That really is a problem. We keep the pressure on by going to the supermarkets and saying we want a Scottish product. We want you to continue to support your Scottish producers. Go to your small, go to your farmers markets when they open up. Go to local producers. Get behind every small producer in the country, whether they're a bakery in the high street or whether it's a, a farmer selling his own beef. You've got to get behind them and support them, and you've got to do it with your pocket and your purse. And but we need to take some of the heat out of that debate about whether there's union jacks on on food produce. And we just need to keep telling the supermarkets we want a Scottish-based product. Um, so we have, a, we have a question that's coming in the Q&A. Did I understand correctly that in the US there is no obligation to state place of origin on food labels? So in the US... I don't know what they do. Any... Sorry, say that again. In the US, do they not need to put place of origin on food labels? I don't know what they have to do in America. I don't know what their system is over there. But what I do know is what the Americans are saying in the trade negotiations that they're currently doing at the moment is that they don't want country of origin food labeling. It's not necessary. So they don't want people to have, to, to have the, the ability to see where their food is coming from. Because they know that it's going, it, 
they know that it potentially could disadvantage them. And 2016, I think the, the agricultural minister from America, I don't know what their, what their equivalent name is, uh, he said, if people don't want to buy American produce, then they won't buy it. But how do you know that it's not American produce if there's no label on it? And it's one of the things that they are trying to thrash out in their trade negotiations is to make sure that they don't have um, country of origin food labeling on it. So we'll do one more um, question from the QA and then we might move on. So if the UK government goes ahead with the agricultural bill, as it is, do you think the Scottish farmers are more likely to support independence? There are, see, there's another thing. <laughs> Every time I put up a post about farming in Scotland, how we're being betrayed and all the rest of it, we then get a whole barrage of people coming on, ah, well, you put you so, chuckle, chuckle, I've never mm -hmm. heard that joke before. Um, again, it's divisive. If you're a farmer who's voted Tory all your life, but you see that things are getting very difficult coming down the line, and you go onto one of these social media sites and you see the barrage of abuse that heads towards farmers by, I'm quite sure, well-intentioned people who clearly just want independence in exactly the same way as I do. If they see that, does it look like a, a, a kind of a home for them? Does it look like someplace that they can come to safely and feel as though they're going to be respected and treated with the kind of concern that we want as a society? There are farmers who are very quietly sitting right now terrified of what's coming down the road mm -hmm. but we have an image and we've created it ourselves where we are the nasty nationalists and the media continue to push that push that issue that we are nasty nationalists and it, it couldn't be further from the truth so let's not give them the ammunition to use it so if a farmer comes on and says this is a disgrace what they're doing with the agricultural bill let's support them let's say well you know what there is a solution to this let's get your independence there is always going to be farmers who are going to vote Tory and there are always going to be farmers who are going to vote the, for the union because they believe in it. It's, it's in their DNA. They fundamentally believe in, in the union in the same way as I fundamentally believe in independence. There is nothing would change my mind about whether Scotland should be an independent country or not. If we choose to be independent, that's our choice. So we need to, again, try and take some of the sting out of that debate that's happening and welcome every single person. Because let's face it, how many people who are in the yes movement right now were yes back in 2010 or 2008 or 1999? There's a hell of a lot of people have come into the yes movement and we've got to welcome every single person and we need to stop barking the ones who have a different opinion to us. We've got to change their minds, we've got to persuade them that independence is the way that we're going to make this country better and we need to stop the, the haranguing them because how is that a welcoming house for them to join? Well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Lorna, were you, are you happy to go next? Yeah, I'm very happy to go next. Um, I'm scared. I've got a presentation, so I was going to do it as a screen share, if that's okay. Perfect. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see my screen okay? Yes, good, okay. Uh, so hi, thanks very much for having me along. I'm Lorna Slater, co-leader of the Scottish Green Party. As um, I was introduced, I am not an expert in Brexit or the environment or uh, in terms of the, the laws around Brexit, and what that's going to mean. I am co-leader of the Scottish Green Party, which is a volunteer role, so I don't get paid to do that. It's something I, I donate my time to do, as does Patrick, as does everybody else who does anything for the Scottish Greens. Uh, my day job is that I'm an electromechanical engineer and I work in marine renewables. So if I was an expert in anything, it would be that. Um, however, I've done some research and our parliamentary staff have very kindly helped me with a bit of a briefing. So I will run through what I've got. Uh, I think it is quite interesting. Uh, I hope you find it interesting and I will do my best to go and find out the answers to any questions you have because it's probable that I don't have them in my head. Although I'm of course happy to answer anything about the Scottish Greens um, or our Green New Deal, that sort of thing. So, let us... Right, we've all seen this 
uh, cartoon, which is that we have a lot of very difficult stuff coming our way. So we're going to have, from the looks of it, uh, COVID-19 hasn't finished playing itself out yet. We've got a massive recession followed close on the tail of the pandemic. Well, what does that mean? It means that vast amounts of investment will be needed to boost the economy. That's, that's a given. Even the Tory party has started lobbing money about, although they can always find a magic money tree when it suits them, if they need to repaint a plane or build a royal yacht. Uh, the question is, the really key question is, where is that money going to go? Because it can go one of two ways. It can go, as did nearly all the money after the banking crash in 2008, to Wall Street, the banks, and wealthy investors. Those all happen to be vested interest in the big polluters and the system as it is. Or that investment could reshape our society into something different, and that would be what a Green New Deal would be. And in the UK, of course, we've got an additional tsunami of disaster on top of the risks to the economy, national security, access to medicine, anti-terrorism support, selling out our food and animal welfare standards to the US. We have all the risks around our environmental standards that Brexit will bring as well. Most of the UK's environmental laws are derived from European law, from water and air quality to nature conservation and climate change. The EU environmental law framework is renowned as one of the strongest in the world. The European Commission and European Court of Justice have also played leading roles in forcing environmental laws and ensuring they are fully implemented by member states. Famously, uh, the EU cleaned up Britain's beaches. That was just one practical application that ordinary people could see. The red tape that Brexiteers are wanting to get rid of in a large part includes the legislation that protects the environment, ironically seen as a nice to have when in fact pollution affects daily, people's daily lives very significantly. Boris Johnson had a spectacularly poor record on air pollution in London when he was mayor. Under his leadership, central London exceeded the particulate limits 47 times. So it was 47 times more polluted than it should have been and has been breaking European laws ever since. A 2016 um, study by King's College of London found that the pollution in London kills nine and a half thousand people in the city each year. Um, Mayor Boris Johnson was accused of public health fraud over his use of dust suppressants. So as from the previous slide, I said that the European Court of Justice and the European Commission enforce the laws in the countries, including air pollution laws. And what they do is they set up monitoring systems in your big cities to see how what your air quality is. And Boris Johnson installed basically little showering systems to try and clean the air next to these monitors. So he didn't bother trying to reduce traffic or you know, get rid of diesel vehicles or any of that. He tried to fool the sensors to make it look like London's air wasn't as good. Sorry, wasn't, wasn't as bad as, as it really was. And so he dodged paying hundreds of millions of EU fines by ordering this sort of cheating tactic. But actually he was putting the public at a great deal of risk. So I think from his track record, we can see that not only does Boris Johnson have no interest in environmental matters or the knock-on effects on health and well-being, but he's willing to lie and deceive about what's really going on to the extent of putting lives at risk. The language that the UK has proposed in its negotiating approach is both misleading and deliberately vague. For example, it states that as an overall principle, irrespective of whatever happens, the UK will not negotiate any arrangement in which it does not have control of its own laws and will not accept any obligations to be aligned with the EU, institutions including the Court of Justice. The UK's negotiating approach states that the agreement governing the future relationship should include reciprocal commitments not to weaken or reduce the level of protection afforded by environmental laws in order to encourage trade or investment. It is notable that this does not provide that the UK will agree to adhere to existing EU environmental laws, um, which will only continue to apply for the transition period, but rather that the existing level of protection should not be weakened or, produced or reduced. This indicates that the UK will, as expected, pursue an outcomes-focused or equivalence-based approach to environmental regulation, but seemingly only in respect to maintaining current levels of protection and not, for example, by adopting a so-called dynamic alignment approach where the UK would effectively match the EU's environmental standards, including how those standards might improve or change over time. It is, however, difficult to reconcile the assertion that the UK will maintain standards with the overall principle that the UK will retain full control over its laws. The UK's negotiating approach provides further that while the future EU-UK agreement should establish cooperation 
provisions between the parties on environmental issues. Those provisions should not be subject to the agreement's wider dispute resolution processes. So basically, if the EU, uh, UK breaks its agreement, they don't want to be punished for it. So they've set themselves up with a very vague sort of statement of that they will keep it as good, really, but we don't want you to check and we're not going to commit ourselves to anything, which is, which is very Boris Johnson. Um, so this has the appearance of the UK telling the EU that while the UK must have the freedom to enact whatever laws it wants, the EU should essentially trust that the UK will adhere to existing environmental standards, but there, there will be no formal process to adjudicate disputes should the UK fail to do so. It does seem unlikely that the EU will accept this. Indeed, the EU's own negotiating guidelines published on the 25th of February of this year expressly provide that there should be a level playing field so as to uphold correspondingly high levels of protection over time. As in, there will be protections, uh, there will be restrictions on the UK's freedom in relation to environmental protection, at least to the extent that the UK wants to retain access to the EU single market. The level playing field means that the EU will not allow a, a trade agreement where the UK gives its own businesses a competitive advantage by holding them to lower environmental standards than the EU companies. It is much cheaper to do business if you don't have to clean up your own mess or pay carbon taxes and so on. And that's what the EU won't allow. So doubts are growing about the future protection of the UK's environment following Brexit. I mean, my doubts aren't growing. I had my doubts pretty significantly before. I don't think Boris Johnson and the Tories have any sort of concept of what the climate crisis requires. They're not even interested in protecting things to the current standards. I think it's a complete disaster. But anyway, the Financial Times reported that an official paper shared with, uh, by ministers proposed to deviate from green standards set by the European Union. It says the UK was open to significant divergence, even though the prime minister has previously promised standards don't fall. And you know Boris Johnson keeps a promise. The government says it doesn't recognize the document, but the paper chimes with the BBC analysis, which suggests the green watchdog planned after Brexit may be toothless. At the moment, Britain's standards on water, air, waste, and wildlife are enforced by the EU. So far, the government ministers have had four chances to guarantee equal environmental standards after Brexit, but have declined the opportunity in all four times. So the prime minister says, when questioned uh, at PMQ, says to look at the environmental bill to see what we can expect. So I did. Uh, the environmental bill has been enhanced and reintroduced to parliament following the government's promise to tackle climate change and restore the natural environment. Cough, cough, yeah, uh-huh. The bill will create a legally binding environmental improvement targets, improvement, improvement for whose benefit anyway, and establish a new independent office for environmental protection. Now independent is a word that should be used cautiously in this context in order to hold the government to account on their promise to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So that's 2050 is one of the least ambitious targets in the world. It's way past the 10 years that the um, IPCC, so IPCC, too many C's, said that we have to actually do something about climate. Um, you, that's a long time in the future. We'll already be at three or four degrees of warming by then. We'll already be flood, cities will be flooded, Glasgow will be flooded, uh, Edinburgh will be flooded up to leaf links by that point. It's much, much too late. So even what they're saying this bill will do is, is not going to be effective to protect us from climate change. Anyway, that back to that being independent office for the environment protection is actually not going to be accountable to parliament. It's going to be accountable to the government. So there's obvious issues with democratic accountability there. So the bill covers a lot of ground and is, according to the people who wrote it, ambitious and bold. Much of its content is uh, about the need to establish new structures and controls in the UK now that we're no longer part of the EU and therefore no longer subject to scrutiny by the European Commission. So it's quite a long bill. Um, it covers loads of different things. I'm not gonna go into the bill in detail here. Mostly that was just my skepticism about its quality. For example, the uh, National Farmers Union has been lobbying hard on the bill to protect the interest of landowners against conservationist and environmental concerns. The NFU's continuing priority is to ensure the bill, this is a quote from them, the NFU's continuing priority is to ensure that the bill safeguards competitive and productive agricultural sector alongside protecting and enhancing the environment. So certainly no commitment. Uh, from them to zero carbon or significant changes in agriculture. So I, our previous speaker, Jim, I absolutely agree with Jim that the goal of having Scotland be self-sustaining in farming is a great one. We should definitely be self-sustaining in food production and agriculture is the root of that. 
agriculture is a sector that needs to be substantially um, revisited in terms of how it interacts with the climate and with, uh, with and with the environment. There's a lot of scope there for improving how we use Scotland's lands, things like grouse moors, for example. Uh, Almost anything you do with a grouse moor is both more environmentally friendly and better economically than shooting birds on it for fun. Uh, so, you know, if we can you bring that land back into the agricultural sector, forestry sector, basically anything else we do with it would be better. So I think there's a whole lot we can do in Scotland around land use and farming, which uh, would be rev revolutionary. We need a revolution in agriculture in Scotland. And I suspect that's not what the NFU means. Uh, the upshot of all of this is that we can expect environmental standards to fall after Brexit. There is nothing in place that says we need to keep aligned with the best practice of EU law and every bit of wiggle room to allow a race to the bottom on standards. Trade deals with the US, which has lower environmental standards, will be a dragging force pulling us down. The environment is a devolved power. However, two years ago, Westminster performed a bit of retroactive sleight of hand that retroactively removed from the Scottish Parliament the right to have control on powers that are returning to the EU, UK from the EU after Brexit, even when those powers related to devolved matters. So how will environmental policy be coordinated in the UK after Brexit? How will minimum standards be decided and by whom? Do devolved administrations have sufficient capacity and resources to develop, implement and enforce it? What are the implications for different sectors, including agricultural fisheries and so on, which are also devolved? So the, there was a continuity bill going through the Scottish government just at the moment. So that's meant to provide for how these powers would be used. But if, as you'd expect, the Scottish Greens feel that uh, this bill should be strengthened to protect Scotland's environment, food standards and wildlife from the Conservative Party's reckless deregulated Brexit. So as to have, so as to have uh, the intention of the bill was to have no gap between Scottish and European standards. So uh, the Scottish Greens would like to see that continuity bill commit us to keeping European standards on all those things, mm -hmm. uh, animal rights, food quality and environmental standards. Uh, and a quote from my fellow co-leader Patrick Harvey, uh, he said, the Scottish Greens welcome any move to protect Scotland's environment against a reckless deregulated Brexit, but clearly this bill doesn't yet provide the same strong environmental safeguards which the EU has provided. If it's going to do that and meet the policy intention, this bill needs to be much stronger. For example, it currently will not replace a requirement on ministers to keep pace with EU protections. We've already seen how the Tories appear to have abandoned their promise to keep cheap chlorinated chicken from being imported from America. The needs uh, for strong commitments to protect standards is urgently needed. Who wrote that? Anyway, it isn't clear that the new public body will sit it isn't clear how the new public body will sit alongside SEPA and Scottish natural heritage, but I'm concerned about its independence, given that it will be led by a government appointee. The proposals for environmental standards Scotland seem too narrow for it to be an effective safeguard, but it at least needs to be an independent, well-funded to be a working regulator. EU law also covers the enforcement of protection of many of our species of wildlife, so the new laws will need to maintain these standards or there is a real risk that we will under undermine recent work on this. So the Green New Deal for Europe is at a pretty advanced stage. So this is something that's been put together by the Green Parties of Europe and is in the European Parliament. So the European Commission, the EU, is, has been publishing parts of it and developing parts of it. I can paste after this, I can paste links to this into the chat for you so you can go and have a look at it yourself. But the idea is that the investment that I talked about at the very beginning of this talk, the investment that will be needed for the recovery of the economy from COVID-19 should be using a green new deal. So we should be shaping the economy and driving ourselves to a zero carbon economy at the same time. The EU recovery plan focuses on green EU green deal initiatives, including the renovation wave. So that's upgrading homes to keep to make them warmer and cheaper to run renewable and decarbonized gases, as well as clean and sustainable mobility and the circular economy. The European Green Deal is Europe's growth strategy to ensure we use its full potential. It is essential that the next generation EU drives our competitive sustainability. Public investments in recovery should respect the green oath to do no harm. Um, the most recent of these is the Just Transition platform, which is fairly progressive from what I can see. It still allows for um, CCS and, and some rather, so that's carbon capture solutions and some kind of far-fetched technological solutions, which is a bit, but you know, if it keeps them happy, but it, do, it is actually progress, progressing somewhere. So I think we can see that the EU, it's far from perfect. It's far from the, you know, the, 
the solution that is, is uh, you know, that the Greens would ideally want, but it is taking significant steps. And so we can see that Brexit, a Brexity UK is going to be splitting from that and going more to the American model of lesser environmental protections, no respect for the climate crisis, not even really properly acknowledging it. And poor old Scotland stuck somewhere in between. So I echo um, Jim's uh, words that independence is really our only way to make sure that we can have a green recovery in Scotland. So the European Commission does seem to recognize the urgency in a way that the UK government does not, and it pledges more real commitments than what the Scottish government has done, particularly around this just transition stuff. And that's just transition means not abandoning the people who currently work in oil and gas and other high emission sectors, but ensuring that retraining and investment in parallel sustainable industries to make sure that we have good jobs for Scottish people. Um, I've just put this video in and I'm hoping it will play. It may not. So this is a video of the machine I'm working on. This is just an example. We're, we're not the only sustainable tidal turbine company working in Scotland. There's lots. But um, this is just an example of one industry that could be part of a just transition to ensure that people currently working in oil and gas and aviation and other industries uh, have jobs to go to. These are well-paid engineering jobs. One of these beasts is 70 meters long. So it's the size of a ship. We're building it in a shipyard in Dundee. Uh, and as I always say to people, that's one of these, making a, keeping a shipyard busy for most of this year. If we were building 10 of them or 50 of them, we could keep Bifab, Ferguson Marine, we could keep the shipyards and dockyards all over Scotland busy, and we could keep people in jobs. So that's what a just transition looks like. It means we plan to move our assets and our talent to new industries. We don't just shut those industries down and, and abandon them. That, that's something we get in the Scottish Greens all the time. Be like, oh, you can't just turn off oil and gas. And we're saying, no, you need to plan for it. Uh, and this yeah, just transition is part of that plan. I'll just skip ahead to the next slide. And I don't know how many double clicks it takes. Oh, no, that was the last slide. So that, that's me. That's uh, where we sit with the environment and Brexit. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lorna. Um, we've got time for one quick question. Um, so I'll take I'll take this question from the Q and A um, because um, Bill had asked one before to Jim that we never read out. So the question is: If Scottish farmers are bound to higher environmental standards by the Continuity Bill, but US farmers are not, and food labelling is unclear, does that not seriously disadvantage Scottish farmers? And he said, as he thinks Jim fairly was. Um, referring to as well. So basically, are yeah. Scottish farmers going to be very disadvantaged? Going By a US trade deal. Well, that's the worry, isn't it? So, and that's exactly everybody's worry. If, and that, that's EU's worry as well, that if we let UK farmers and Scottish farmers st you know, work to lower environmental standards, that means that we're disadvantaging EU people. And if we allow imports of American food that's been produced to lower standards, we're disadvantaging our own people. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the danger of this US trade deal. That's why it's so I worrying. I think it was the combination of the continuity bill as well, because then the Scot Scottish farmers maybe would have to stick to the Scottish standards, so they would be disadvantaged. But I so, think agrees, yes. Yeah, it's the two things together. It's a real problem, isn't it? Because we all definitely want to produce high, well, continue to produce high quality food, which is a recognized quality brand, but we would be putting our farmers in a terrible bind if we uh, force them to do that and allow imports of the of American low quality food. So I mean, the answer to me is to not allow the American food imports to do what we can to campaign against that. So it's one of those frustrating, slippery things where the Tory government keeps going, oh, we wouldn't allow this and then actually allowing it. Do you know what I mean? Like they say one thing and do another. So I think it's up to all of us and opposition parties to really, really hold them to account for that. And I actually think this is an excellent wedge um, for, as Jim referred to, to start bringing people over to the independence movement who maybe hadn't thought about it before. When you say, look, this is what Westminster's doing. They are not looking out for your interests. They are going to make your business more difficult, less competitive. They're going to make you produce, you know, food and product that you're less proud of, that you're, you know, that you doesn't have the high standards that you're used to producing. I think people will reconsider whether being part of the EU as an independent Scotland would actually be better for them. Um, I'll just say one more question because this was quite an interesting one. It said the EU environmental framework is seen as the strongest in the world. 
and yet it's still way, way off being enough. So I think, and there, it was quite a long question, but I think they were basically trying to say that even though they talk a good game, they're still not doing enough, even with the Green Deal. Yeah, so that's a problem everywhere. It's, it's the, the, the reality of what the climate crisis requires, uh, it really hasn't sunk in at all. No, nobody anywhere is doing enough to avert us from the climate crisis. At the moment, at the levels we're going at, we're looking at six, seven, eight degrees of warming. At six degrees of warming, 95% of life on Earth is extinct. Uh, we're looking at now four, uh, three and a half, four degrees of warming in the next 50 to 100 years. Some kids who are currently climate striking will be my age, 30 years, we reach three degrees of warming when that happens, they will see this. I expect to live my old age in a, in a refugee camp. Um, I was, it's, the climate crisis is something that really people have not got their heads around. I'll, I'll just give you one more set of numbers and then I'll, I'll leave you to it. But for a given example, to avoid the climate catastrophe, to avoid this extinction event, which is why Extinction Rebellion call themselves that, to avoid extinction, to avoid the six degrees of warming, every human on the planet needs to only emit 1.5 tons of carbon per year. 1.5. We currently, as a species, everyone on the planet on average, currently emits 7.5 tons of carbon. Now, per year. Now imagine that you had to reduce your income to 15 or 20% of your current um, of your current income. If you had to live on only 15 to 20% of your current income, that would require a significant change to your way of life. I mean, massive. Every single aspect of your life would be changed by that. And that's what we're talking about. It's that kind of enormous scale of change. Now, most of that change um, is stuff that you can't, you personally can't do anything about. Your, your individual choices about whether you drive to work or take the train have almost nothing to do with it. What has to do with it is how your steel is smelted, how diesel ships are used to bring you your produce from around the world instead of having locally grown stuff, because it's cheaper because they have lower standards on the other side of the world. It's all about these systems that you don't have control over. And that's why governments and things like the EU are so important because only they can change the systems. Um, so yeah, don't feel guilty if you're, you know, about your little carbon footprint, because it, it's not you as an individual. In a world where it's cheaper to fly to London than take the train, there's kind of nothing you can do about that. You're not going to be able to shrink your carbon footprint to 1.5 tons of carbon, but it could be done if we had cheap public transport, if we had cities designed around people, if we had well insulated homes, if we had electricity from tidal energy, like it's totally possible to do it, but it needs facing up to the scale of change needed and basically nobody's doing it. Thank you very much, Lorna. That's great. Um, okay, can we move on now to Professor Alison Pollock? Thank you very much. If you unmute. Can you, can yes. you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Sorry, I can't see the screen for some reason. The screen share has gone off. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think uh, I probably don't have very much to say about, um, I suppose there are three aspects to this. Um, there's the domestic policies and what the government is actually pursuing because they're quite instrumental in determining both Brexit and any US trade deal that is done. And uh, I think it's really important to look at what's happening domestically. And, I th and one of the issues um, about COVID is the way in which we've seen a massive deregulation going on. And my area of expertise is health, um, but it's happening, you can see it with education, you can see it in every sphere. And I'm really concerned about the powers actually the UK government and all the governments have taken on to deal with the um, COVID pandemic. And I think that needs to be watched very carefully um, because the one thing that COVID has done is highlighted our vulnerabilities. It's highlighted how ill-prepared the UK government, and I include all the four nations in this, were. Uh, were for COVID, the lack of action on travel, on quarantine, the extraordinary delays, 
and um, the fact that the health services were reduced to uh, an emergency COVID service and still are pretty much, although they're beginning to get going. Um, but that has resulted in catastrophic delays for many people um, and we will see a backlog in waiting lists. And of course, I don't need to bring home to you what's actually happened in nursing care, where Scotland, as much as England, has been absolutely disastrous in their handling of social care and of the people. Um, and I'm very concerned that part of the response of the UK government has been a knee-jerk reaction instead of, instead of doing an analysis of why we were so ill-prepared um, in the NHS and rebuilding capacity that has been lost and eroded uh, that a lot of money and which may well end up with the government having even more problems later down the line. And I'll touch on two or three of these. One is the Nightingale Hospitals, which was a UK, a UK approach and of course have lain empty, but they've cost um, many, many millions and we haven't seen the contract for those. The second is the approach to building a commercial diagnostics industry instead of reinvesting in NHS laboratories. Uh, the third is the extraordinary time that was waited on an NHS app, which you all know about. Um, and um, the amount of money that's been thrown at um, private sector providers, the hospitals, both in Scotland and also social care, without thinking about what kind of society we want to live, what are our values, what are our principles, and how should that care be organised? Now, you can, uh, I can understand people being in a panic in the early stages, but we're now four months into an epidemic and I'm still not confident that we've got the right measures in place, um, but also that we've got the right domestic policies. And the reason why the, uh, these domestic policies are so important is because they determine the extent to which we're exposed uh, from Brexit, um, post-Brexit, but also to US trade deals. Because the more we've liberalized and opened up our public services, the less room that we have to negotiate. And I did work with colleagues actually in 2000, so this is now 20 years ago, on the World Trade Organization and the GATS, which showed the way in which the UK government had failed to protect hospital services from being opened up. So, I think this is really, um, really important that we need to look much more closely at our domestic policies and also our taxation policies. I know Jim was saying how wonderful the Scottish uh, food and uh, alcohol industry is, but how much of those taxes are actually returning into the public purse and how much is actually being sheltered through big global multinational corporations? That would be a question to answer. And, um, uh, the same with our pharmaceutical industry as well and the diagnostics industry. Um, we've been part of the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, but that we've seen a lot of deregulation going on of medicines um, and diagnostics uh, with the desire to open a, ma a market rather than protecting public health. Um, so I don't intend to speak very long because you've had a lot of speakers but I would just urge everybody to look very carefully at the framing of the domestic policies. Um, we still have horrible policies like the Private Finance Initiative, but also Scottish Futures Trust, where though the UK government threw a lot of money at the health service to write off the debts of hospitals, say in England, but that will also have impacted on the Scottish budget. Um, it hasn't done anything about opening up these contracts on roads, on schools, where we're paying exorbitant amounts of interest. I mean, interest rates have never been so low, almost into negative figures. And yet on these PFI contracts, we're paying enormous sums of money, anything from five to 15% interest rates, and that's without the returns on equity being factored in. And yet we have had no, no uh, analysis of conversation about where money is going and how it's being spent. 
We also have contracts now being awarded without going out to tender. We've seen that specific, specifically, I've seen it in health and social care. Um, and those contracts have not been published, so we don't know whether they're valued for money. And the NAO has already raised serious concerns, but this will be too late down the line. So I'm very concerned about the extraordinary powers that the government has at the moment, um, the lack of accountability, both fiscal and public and the public accountability for how our money is spent and to make sure it's good value and where the money is actually going. You're absolutely right. We're in for a major, major recession. And it's the young people who will suffer most. It's the young people who have been sacrificed in this epidemic, although they were least at risk. The young people who have been failed not be, uh, in not having their schooling and their education. Um, and uh, I think we could and must do an awful lot better. This epidemic has um, exposed all our vulnerabilities, why we need each other, our vulnerability to others, why we need health and social care, why we need public services, why we need safety nets, why we need support. It's also exposed the huge inequalities in our society between rich and poor, which are widening. And also, of course, the social deprivation, the effect on black and ethnic minority groups, but especially on older people, because older people have borne the brunt with the excess deaths. Um, we have an issue already with our domestic policies in that, unlike many countries in Europe, we've deregulated our workforce hugely. It's absolutely abysmal that a quarter of our social care workers, we have about 1.6 million throughout the UK, about 250,000 in Scotland, they're on extremely low pay and they're on zero hour contracts. So my feeling is, if we're going to be really serious about talking about anything, we have to look at the moat in our own eye and start with our domestic policies and identify the extent to which we've already gone down the road to huge deregulation. Um, of course, we could get a workforce in agriculture and on farms. There's plenty of unemployed people and who are being furloughed. But the issue is their terms and conditions and their pay and their living conditions and the training. Um, and that's no different from the social care workforce. So um, I'm not taking either a, a nationalist or a pro-Europe or anything uh, bent, but I do think that we've got a lot to learn from Europe. Um, we have a lot, European countries have handled this pandemic much, much better than the UK. And that's partly because they realise the importance of public services and the fiscal um, safety net. Uh, we've congratulated our Treasury on its actions around furloughing, but that's going to come to an end. And I think the Institute for Fiscal Studies has already published data to show we've been less generous than other countries. Um, so I can't stress enough that I think um, we really need to decide what kind of society we want to live in, what the principles are and the organising framework, and really look much more closely at domestic policies. The Scottish Government's done lots of good things, but it could do much better. Um, it's had a commitment to human rights, but those rights have been severely eroded through the epidemic. And those rights have been particularly eroded for older people people with disabilities, people with mental health problems. And indeed their rights have been reduced to the sort of basic necessary for life rather than compatible with, with human rights. And we have a first minister who's completely committed to human rights. And yet we're seeing the erosion of those rights during this pandemic. So um, I feel I've gone on, on enough, but um, uh, it's always the domestic policies that leave us open to deregulation and to trade agreements because we haven't taken enough care to protect, whether it be our sale of goods or our services or the quality of food or the agriculture. If we haven't taken the necessary measures, then we leave ourselves extremely exposed. And Europe has done a lot um, to try and put in protective measures around health, around food, around the environment. And we are going to be weaker without um, that uh, collective voice um, uh, for support. 
Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we've got some questions. Um, yes, um, again, we have lots of questions. So um, from the Q&A, what will be the impact of health if we leave the transition period during another spike of COVID-19? So basically, if we're in a spike of COVID-19 uh, come January, what effects will we see from that? For what? Because of the transition? If we leave the transition, no, yeah. The effects will be because of um, government action um, and having taken the necessary steps to protect its population if we're in a second spike. Um, of course, there are lots of concerns about medicines, about drugs, about vaccines, um, and the pricing agreements, uh, etc. Uh, and they're, they're, of course, important considerations, but I can't second guess what's actually going on. Um, we have a question um, saying, what lessons should we draw from the UK government's approach to the, the corona crisis about how they approach the post-Brexit crisis after the 31st of December 2020? Um, so we're talking about the UK government now and what, you know, the way they've handled things and what, how they treat their people. Yes, I mean, I think the UK government's uh, performance has been absolutely abysmal and it has resulted, there is no doubt, in many excess deaths, excess deaths from COVID, but also non-COVID. And the government, UK government is only, and, and the Scottish government, we must actually look at all the deaths that are occurring because of non-COVID. So it's been absolutely abysmal. Um, the Scottish government for far too long went along with the UK government um, and I don't know why it did that but maybe there was a financial incentive to do so. Um, I have to contrast it with Wales which did its own thing around testing for example. Um, and um, I'm, I, I'm very apprehensive. I don't think we have a functioning um, competent government um, at the moment. And it's, uh, and, it's very, and it's very frightening. We are seeing a lot of money now being parceled out through uh, contracts which haven't gone formally to tender, um, where there is no doubt um, that, that you know, many of these will subsequently be shown to be not value for money and a waste of, our, of public money. So I'm very, very apprehensive um, about the current negotiations and the future negotiations. So we have a question that was sent in beforehand. Um, it says, Nicola Sturgeon has said she cannot rule out introducing quarantine or screening for travellers coming from England if infection rates rise south of the border. Do you think that closing the border with England would help eliminate the COVID um, virus in Scotland? That's a controversial question. Yes, I think it's really interesting. I mean, we have a pandemic it's, so every country has COVID. So the question is, why did we not introduce quarantine and travel restrictions back in February? We knew what was happening and we didn't. And the UK government, including the Scottish government, were almost unique in not offering, in not having any travel or quarantine restrictions. So we're only doing it four months into it. Um, it's, reg it's regrettable, but... Um, uh, Unless, um, I mean, we're now seeing in England um, probably more local lockdowns are going to be happening. Um, so you may end up having uh, travel restrictions and quarantine, but it's difficult to know whether the government could actually impose that. Um, you, I mean, uh, from a health point of view, because obviously in Scotland, I mean, what the, the big question of the day is in Scotland, we're actually managing to get um, at the moment anyway, the, um, the levels of the virus in the community down, which, yeah. you know, you were saying about the elderly, um, especially, in, you know, we all have elderly parents who are desperate to come out. So from that point of view, you know, if we can get the virus down, then we are reversing the, the um, bad things that were done in the first place, maybe. But with... Um, and, but if we have an insurge of tourists from England, we could revert, you know, that could cause a lot of local outbreaks very quickly. That's the worry. Um, Do you think from a health point of view that would... 
Well, I suppose there are two or three things. One is, um, have you got a good monitoring system in place? Are you confident that it's working? And have you got a good contact tracing system in place so that when patients present with symptoms, you can get on top of an outbreak? I mean, it's quite complicated because not everybody, uh, some, some people are much higher risk of spreading and shedding the virus than others. Um, but you can imagine a situation where you might say, we're having a cordon sanitaire because Scotland is now down to no cases or very few cases. So then you would do temperature monitoring and you might do uh, quarantine. Um, you could Im imagine that situation beginning to happen. Uh, indeed, that, would, that made a lot of sense in the Highlands and Islands earlier on where the Western Isles um, and Orkney had uh, almost no cases. You could have had a cordon sanitaire operating there and then that would have allowed the community to go back to school and back to work. So, um, uh, and as in Germany, you may have a regional approach and regional lockdown measures where you actually restrict mobility in and out. I mean, the whole problem with the government's approach is it's taken a very centralised national approach and the Scottish government was equally guilty of going along with this. And really the whole logic of local contact tracing is you would have a regional approach much more devolved, but that means you've got to have really good local data, really good contact tracing, all the other public health measures like hand washing, et cetera, in place um, and social distancing. And at the same time, um, you, uh, you might then have cordon sanitaire around regions where you actually restrict mobility in and out. So it's not impossible that you might say you would have some border controls um, as you're doing in airports and ports where they're going to be doing temperature testing. But the big problem is enforcing quarantine um, and supporting quarantine and monitoring quarantine because quarantine means a big sacrifice for the people who are going into quarantine. They need to be supported financially and in their housing. Um, and there needs to be community health monitoring. And I'm not convinced that we have got that right yet. Um, right, Kat, do you want to move on to some more general questions? I don't know, are you still there, Jim? Can we get you, can you hear us? Oh, I'm not sure. So we had some other questions for you, Lorna. Um, if we go to the pre-asked questions, actually. Um... I'm afraid I have another meeting to go to at eight o'clock, so I've got four, four minutes right. and then I have to run away. I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, I'll ask, I'll ask the questions that are to you then first. I tried, uh, tried to start looking through the Q&A to see what I could find. But... <laughs> um, there's a lot to do with um, you know, people saying about Dominic Cummings, but I'm not sure that that's to, um, and that the UK government prioritised business over general health. Um, is WEA2 the way forward? Um, I had a question actually more general to you about the, um, the medicines agency and especially to do with um, Scottish independence because obviously that's, you know, the two aims of our group are one to independence and two to join the EU. Um, if we leave the EU, is there anything that we'll notice um, about our, you know, you sort of touched on it with the, the COVID, but is there anything that we'll particularly notice? Um, about the health and especially research, um, which is my area of interest, and whether that um, there'll be a sort of di um, if we diverge from the EU health standards, for example, whether it will be difficult to go back. Who's that question? Yes, sorry for Alison. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Um, gosh, that's quite a difficult one. Um, I mean, the European Medicine Agency has already deregulated, um, unfortunately, a lot of the pathways uh, for ed medicines. So in my opinion, when I've looked at the evidence, medicines are being given uh, far too rapid approval uh, without sufficient analysis of the benefits and harms. Um, and... Um, the, the, there's a risk that this will, uh, and of course that this, this will carry on. Um, it's exactly the same in the US FDA. 
Many of the benefit, many of the medicines that are being approved are extremely expensive, but not with no real benefit, and they're based on something called surrogate outcomes. So we don't have hard outcome measures. Um, so my own feeling is that the whole medicine system needs to be radically looked at, and it's part of what kind of society do we want and how we're going to prioritize our medicines and new medicines and actually stimulate really meaningful research because innovation has been taken to mean anything that's new rather than truly innovative and truly um, making a difference. Um, and uh, I think we also need to take a long, hard look at the way in which research is actually funded and how universities are being funded as well to do research. There's a huge amount of waste that happens in research um, and partly because of this competitive bidding process, um, which is very unhealthy, it's very time wasting, and it doesn't necessarily re re result in the right questions being asked. Um, but anyway, these are my views of, of, so I think, you know, we really, this is all part of, I mean, all these things give us an opportunity to think about what kind of society we want and our principles and especially as we go, we're going to be going into a major recession where redistribution is going to be on people's minds. We have to be thinking very creatively and differently. The danger is that we'll end up just wanting to go back to the old ways and not thinking differently about how we organize ourselves as a society. Um, I think there was one other question um, to Alison, sorry, that was sent in. So I'll read that before you have to go. Um, it was from somebody that said, I listened to you and your colleagues at an independent SAGE Zoom meeting last week. Um, um, and was disappointed to find that the COVID-19 statistics that were presented referred to the situation in the UK, whereas in reality, the data was collected in England. The picture is different in Scotland. Why was this not made clear to the audience? <laughs> I think that's a very fair point, And I think it's a really good point. And I think it's partly because um, um, the real catastrophe that's taking place is in England at the moment. It really is a chaotic, confused mess. So, um, but I think that's a very valid point. Um, but of course, if you've got 55 million people in England and uh, things are not working, then of course the dangers for Wales and Scotland are very real um, with cross-border flows, as, as one of the earlier questioners asked about quarantine. So I think that's a very fair criticism and it's one that I will take back to independent stage. It's one that we've made before. Um, uh, and I, I think there's no excuse for it really. Yeah, uh, just on social media, I think it's something that people are frustrated about that people equate UK with England, where and it's so we the Scottish Scotland need criticism of the governments and need criticism of what we're what's happening here, but we don't get get that as much because we don't we get all what's happening else. Yes. yes, I mean maybe you should have an eye sage for Scotland actually. <laughs> um, I, think, no, I think we do. Do we not have our own independent? Pardon? I think that the Scottish government now have a. Um, and, and they do. Yeah. Um, but the minutes are very disappointing. The minutes are cursory and it's not clear. Um, the members of the stage group for Scot or the Scottish expert group are also members and give evidence. So they're not really independent. And what you need is critical. Critical voices may not be popular, but they're really necessary, I think, in a democracy. And it's very healthy. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we, we all we all um, are part of society and we all want to contribute um, to making it better. So, yeah, so will we move on to questions? Some of the other questions, there was ones um, for further up that um, the... Just to mention that it is eight o'clock now. Yes. So do, do we want to continue on or will, do you want to end here? There's quite a lot more questions, but... Um, Maybe we could have a few more or um, we can finish it here because we did start quite late. So, I mean, if Alison needs to go, obviously. I'm fine. I'll stay on for another five minutes, but I'm aware that I've hogged all the answers. <laughs> no. And there are 
That's so, great. Uh, I, should, I think I should go and let you um, have questions for the other people. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for all the wonderful questions. They're very thoughtful. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Do we still have Lorna? Lorna's also left. Oh, she's had to leave. So we can yeah, just have a couple more questions to Jim and then we can finish. So one of them was, could you comment on the announcement from Liz Trust that a new trade and agricultural commission be established in particular, um, which bodies be represented in the commission and how can the recommendations be adhered to and how will the commission relate to Scotland? You need to unmute. Unmute. <laughs> Unmute. Got you. Is that better? Yes. Right. Okay. The the commission, as far as I can see from what we know about it, is nothing more than throwing the industry a bone. Um, it has. A, it's only just been announced. Um, it's going to look at how we uh, keep the food industry strong, um, but it's advisory. It's uh, time limited, and I think it is purely a method of the UK government stalling criticism until such time as they pursue their trade deals. Um, I know that NFU and NFUS are all saying this is this is good news, uh, but given the track record of the, the UK government uh, so far, and given their promises that they have broken time and time again, um, I think it's nothing more than a, a fig leaf for uh, uh, an issue that they are trying to wriggle their way through. And I don't think it'll have any jurisdiction. I don't think it'll have any effect. And I think the trade deals will continue along the lines that they've already tried. So Liz Truss has already said that what she's trying to do is get tariffs um, reduced in American agricultural produce in order to smooth the deals. So I, I have no faith in it whatsoever. Thank you. Um, do we want to end there, Sam? Do you want to say thank you to everybody for joining? <laughs> well, yes. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Oh, that was fantastic. Really very, uh, very useful information about uh, supporting Scottish brands and, and um, eating Scottish. Um, Unfortunately, Lorna and Alison have already left, so we can't thank them. We'll, we'll thank them by email. But thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that we asked most of your questions, and uh, hopefully we'll have more of these webinars coming up very soon. And, uh, yeah, please follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and um, also uh, we have a website. I think the link is in the chat. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining in, and asking brilliant questions and good night. Thank you. I have a, sorry, before you, you go question, I, uh, before you go Jim, I have a quick question for you. I don't know if anybody's still listening, but um, it was just, it was quite interesting what you were saying about the waiters um, being the professionals in other countries and, um, you know, treated like unskilled workers here. And I just wondered whether yeah. you thought it was, because um, I know in France they have not just sort of agricultural colleges, but sort of colleges where people learn, you know, all aspects of the food trade. Um, yeah. And I just wondered whether you thought it might be worth Scotland having, um, you know, it, to go along with their increased food standards, you know, having an institute for, um, for the catering industry, if you like, in that kind of way. Well, there is one. There's a fantastic one. It's called the Hospital Industries Trust Scotland. And what they do is they set up scholarships for um, uh, all, all forms of hospitality training. And uh, it, it's actually something that's very close to my heart. My brother uh, passed away in 2019. He was the only two Michelin star chef in Scotland. And the Scottish government put finances into Hospital Industry Trust in order to um, set up a scholarship in Andy's name because of the fact that he was the only two Michelin star chef. He was, he was world renowned. And um, those kinds of things are already happening. The, the, the hospital industry is a fantastic industry at looking after its own and giving really good training. And we are, I'm going to get a wee plug in here. I'm climbing Kilimanjaro next September in 2021 in order to raise funds for the Cornhill Hospice in Perth 
and also for the 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 uh, Andrew Fairley scholarship. So if anybody wants to go into my Virgin Money Giving page, please do. Um, but th that already exists, but it's something that we need to expand and really appreciate the value of it because you can't have an industry that is so um, important to the Scottish economy, but it's still regarded as a low skilled uh, industry. We really need to start looking at it as a, as a career and as a professional career that people are proud to be a part of. That's great, thanks. So yeah, thank you very much and thanks for joining us. And everybody, the other people, there's still 25 people here, so thank you to them as well for staying on and listening to my extra question at the end. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.